I am the good shepherd. This famous passage from John's Gospel has, has resonance and memory that is deep rooted in the Old Testament. It's even possible that the, the I am part of this saying is in itself designed to remind us of that wonderful passage in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, where Moses, Moses asks, God, when I go to the people and I say that you've sent me, then who shall I say has sent me? What, what name shall I say? And God says to Moses, I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. There are many I am sayings in John's gospel in particular. I wonder, is he deliberately wanting us to remember? Is Jesus deliberately pointing back? Here it is, I am the good shepherd. And again, language of shepherds has deep resonance in the Old Testament. We've already heard this morning from the most famous of the Psalms, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But the prophets have much to say about shepherds too. Shepherd language in the prophets is usually language for the political and religious leaders of the people and remember in many times it's very hard to tell the difference between the religious and political leaders of the people. The prophets have much to say about the bad shepherds who lead the people and Jesus comes in with this contrast, I am the good shepherd. I don't know whether you can imagine a world in which the religious and political leaders of the day are not good shepherds, but are bad shepherds. I don't know whether you can imagine a world where political leaders might do things for their own self gain rather than for the good of the people. I don't know whether you can imagine a world in which religious leaders might be in it for the prestige rather than for the service. I think you probably can. But Jesus comes into a world like that and says, I am the good shepherd. And the first imagery that he uses of this good shepherd is that the good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. He, he paints a contrast with the image of the hired hand that is not simply the contrast between the haves and the have-nots, the owners and the servants, but is the contrast between someone who is intimately involved and engaged, has a, has a relationship that is worth something and is meaningful, in contrast with the hired hand who is simply watching the clock, waiting for the shift to be over, wanting to get on with what happens next. And the good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. Of course, the hired hand will run off when the wolf comes. I mean, wouldn't you? And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And when push comes to shove, I will lay down my life for the sheep. Five times in this passage, Jesus uses the language of laying down his life. When you find repetition like that, you need to take notice. Five times in this short passage, I lay down my life. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life. I have the power to lay it down. Remember, we are in the season of Easter. And we now know what this language of laying down and taking up again refers to. 
It must have been so much harder for the first hearers as Jesus spoke. We live in the resurrection reality that Jesus laid down his life and took it up again in resurrection. But in this passage, Jesus speaks of how he lays down his life. It's, it's not taken from him. There is no accident about the events of Good Friday. There is no, nothing takes him by surprise in the way that he will be treated in Holy Week. He lays down his life deliberately, powerfully, purposefully, and he will take it up again. I am the good shepherd, and a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus repeats the good shepherd saying a little further on, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. This intimate relationship between shepherd and sheep, this intimate relationship between Jesus and us is likened by him to the relationship he has with God himself. The relationship between God and Jesus, between father and son, is likened to the relationship between shepherd and sheep. The good shepherd, I know my own and my own know me. This is a wonderful, powerful, intimate relationship. But it's not a closed shop. It's not shut down and narrowed off. Rather, it's an expansive, inclusive relationship. I have other sheep, says Jesus. My goodness, there has been an awful lot of ink spilt over this passage. What was Jesus referring to when he spoke of these other sheep? These other sheep who will be included, these other sheep who will be welcomed in, these other sheep who will be part of the sheepfold. Was he speaking to the disciples about the fact that a large number will be gathered around them as the gospel is taken out and people respond? Was he speaking about the fact that the people of Israel is to whom he has come initially, but, but the message will include the Gentiles too. Was he speaking prophetically to churches who believe that they are the way, the truth and the life, rather than him being the way, the truth and the life? Was he speaking of churches that need to understand that God's way is even bigger even broader? Was he challenging us about how we treat people of other faiths, of other religions? Wherever you see the boundaries being drawn, a passage like this reminds us that boundaries are for pushing. Boundaries are for expanding. There is an openness, a wideness, a depth to God's mercy. Over the years, I found that there have been times when I have been, I have been shocked by the realization of how great God's grace is, that it includes people I didn't think would be included. And every time I am shocked with that realization, I am also challenged that I've not seen it all yet. That these boundaries are not boundaries to God. This passage sits within John's Gospel where we read that God so loved the world. I am not yet in a place where I could say that everybody in the world must respond to God and come to heaven. There is free will, 
but I am absolutely in that place that says the wideness of God's mercy, the depth of God's love means that there is the, there will be the opportunity for all to respond. All can be welcomed in. He is the good shepherd and the good shepherd knows his own and his own know him. But I have other sheep and they will listen to my voice. So how do we respond to a passage like this? Well, I'm going to cheat by not telling you how I think we should respond, by telling you what I think John says is a response to this good shepherd. From the first letter, according to John, and chapter 3 and verse 16, we read this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and we will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from God whatever we ask because we obey God's commandments and do what pleases him. And this is God's commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We are challenged to love like that too. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. We are challenged to love like that too. Will we? Amen. As a response, we're going to use